This evening uh, we're going to be looking, as I've said, at uh, what James tells us the, this, that is the nature of, of saving faith, that it isn't a bare faith, a faith that is just a mere profession, a mere belief in uh, a system of doctrine, but it's actually a life-changing faith, one uh, that shows that the Spirit of God actually is living in our souls. Let me uh, read for you a section of James chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 26, as we begin. James writes, the inspiration of the Spirit, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, this morning we were looking at the extent of God's love uh, for us if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. That as I've already told you, he was willing to give the one whom he loved most of all, his, his only son, his only unique son, the one he delighted in, the one he took pleasure in because he is the one who is the very image of God. That he was willing to give him to come into this world in order to suffer his full wrath on the cross and to do that for us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet his enemies. Now the reason why Jesus brought that up, I believe, in, in the context with his conversation with Nicodemus is that he was showing uh, the basis upon which there was a new birth, why such a thing could exist, why God can give this precious gift. The reason he can give the Spirit is because he gave his Son. Now we also saw how we can know that what he did actually applies to us, that he actually did this for us. The evidence is faith. If we believe in the Son of God, we are saved. And we can't do that apart from the birth or the new birth, the second birth of the Holy Spirit, which means if we believe, we know we have that gift. But now you know very well, by now I'm sure, as, as I do, that there's a lot of disagreement over what Jesus means by this, what he means by believe in him and you will be saved. Uh, there are so many in the church who think that what he means is simply believe the facts. As a matter of fact, the college I went to believed exactly that. Just believe what God says about Jesus Christ. Just believe, you know, that what he says is true and repent of every false belief that you might possibly have. And you're saved. You thought Jesus was a lunatic. Now you know he's the Lord. That's repentance. You changed your mind. Uh, if you believe that he is the Savior, if you believe that he is God in human flesh, you're saved. Now, sadly, there's also many people who know that that isn't true, who know what the Bible actually says about the new birth, who knows that there's much more to it than this, that there must be a change of life, that there must be these works that James speaks of here, but who live essentially the same way as those who believe you don't have to have works. Now, the point that James is driving at in our passage this evening is that that isn't any better. 
Either way, a faith that doesn't have works, that doesn't result in works, that doesn't produce a radical change in the way you live is not a saving faith. Uh, it's a dead faith. And a dead faith, uh, contrary to what some believe, cannot save you. Now what I'd like to do this evening is simply divide what saving faith is into the three parts that the reformers um, divided it into to give us a better understanding of faith, uh, what it's supposed to be, so that we'll be able to see more clearly whether or not we have the kind of faith that saves us, the kind that Jesus was talking about in our passage this morning, the kind that proves that we have experienced the new birth. Certainly there's no value in believing that you have saving faith when you don't have saving faith. And if you don't, it's better to find out sooner than later, isn't it? So that you might do what you need to do about it before it's too late. So that you might arrive in heaven uh, at the end of your life. Now the three parts of saving faith, according to the reformers, of course, are the notes or the content of faith. You have to have something to believe. The assent to those facts, you need to believe those things are true, those facts are true, that content. And of course you need to trust, you need to act on those facts. I think a simpler way to put it is you have to have the right facts about Jesus, you have to have the conviction that those facts are true, and you have to act on that truth according to what that truth is. Now first of all, let's consider that to have a saving faith, you do need to have the right facts about Jesus Christ. And it may sound like, you know, that's a no-brainer, but um, it isn't always the case. The majority of people in our country actually believe that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. They're going to go to the good place. They're not going to go to the bad place if, in fact, such a place exists. And why do they believe that? Because they choose to believe that God is a God of love who cannot send anyone to hell. He's just not capable of doing it. He couldn't really love, as the Bible says that he loves, and send anyone to such a place. Others believe that hell is really a place for the really bad people. Certainly not for them. Because for them, their good works are going to outweigh their bad. Now, is, is that what the Bible teaches? It isn't. But they choose to believe it anyway because that's what they want to believe. Ultimately, a person is going to believe what they want to believe. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they're eventually going to live in a paradise in this world, that they're not going to be annihilated because they're a part of the Watchtower organization. And they go door to door sharing this uh, teaching of theirs, trying to convince people that they're right because their founder, Charles Russell, taught them that this was the truth and they chose to believe it. Mormons believe that they're going to live in a paradise on earth as well and that they're not going to be annihilated because they believe they're a part of the only true church. What they believe is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Some of them even believe that one day they're going to be a god of their own planet because their prophet Joseph Smith taught them that this is the truth and they chose to believe it. Muslims believe that they're going to go to heaven to enjoy sensual pleasures with uh, their God, that God has those things there for them, because they observe the teachings of their prophet Muhammad, who says that all you have to do is believe that Allah is the true God and Muhammad is his prophet, pray five times a day, give 2.5% of your income to the poor, fast during the month of Ramadan, and make at least one pilgrimage to Mecca in your lifetime. Of course, there's also a more direct way, and that is if you kill an infidel or die in a holy war. Well, they believe that because that's what their prophet taught them, and that's what they have chosen to believe. There are even many in the church, in true churches, who believe that they're going to heaven simply because they believe the facts about Jesus Christ. They believe he is the Son of God. They believe he died on the cross for sinners. They don't necessarily believe they need to repent or consecrate or set their lives apart for God for his service, either because that's what they were taught or having been taught something contrary, they have chosen not to believe the truth but to think they're okay just because that is what they choose to believe. 
Now, I hope you understand that all those that I've just described in all these various categories, none of them are really going to get what they expect to receive for one simple reason. What they believe is not true. What they believe is a lie. And a lie cannot save you no matter how firmly you happen to believe it. Now, as you've already seen, Jesus came down from heaven. He came, he came down to reveal his word to you so that you would know the truth. Jesus sent his spirit to guide the prophets in, in the Old Testament to record his truth. Uh, he assumed, as it were, bodily, well, not as it were, he, he became a man and communicated in our language in the most simple terms so that we might know the truth. And, of course, he guided his apostles and prophets of the New Covenant to record and further explain what it is he said so that you and I would not be mistaken about what we must do in order to be saved and the kind of life that we will live if we have, in fact, been saved. Uh, the simple point here is this, that if you don't have a right belief, you can't have a saving faith. Now, I don't mean absolutely if you happen to get one little item wrong uh, in, in somewhere in Scripture as far as what God calls you to believe or do, but certainly it applies to those foundational truths that have to do with God and His salvation. If you don't believe in the triune God, you can't be saved because you're trusting a false God. If you don't believe in the, the Jesus who is both God and man, you can't be saved because you're trusting in a false Christ. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you're not trusting in the right Christ because you're trusting in somebody who is actually no more than a mere man. If you believe that you're saved by good works, you can't be saved because salvation is by grace through faith alone. And if you believe that you can be saved without consecrating your lives entirely to Jesus Christ, if you think that you can be a Christian and live like the rest of the world lives in any other way than how God wants you to live, you can't be saved because James tells us saving faith is an obedient faith and it's obedient not to just what one wants to do, but what the Lord tells you you must do. This is what James teaches us in our text and we'll look at that more under the third point. But you do need to believe that. You can't simply come to God any way you want to. You can't live any way that you please and expect to arrive in heaven. You have to come in God's way or you cannot come at all. If you have the kind of faith that saves, you will follow what the Bible actually says and not what you think it says and not what you want it to say, but what it actually does say. So your faith has to have the right content. You have to believe, or you have to have the right facts, you know, in order to believe. Now secondly, knowing the facts, if you have a saving faith, you will be convinced that those facts are true. I think you understand it's possible to have the truth, to know what the Bible says, and still not believe that what it says is true. I mean, how many people do you know that were raised in a Christian household? that were raised in a church that was Bible-believing, that taught the Scriptures faithfully, and they were taught the truth their entire lives. But they never really believed it, and so they never followed the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we all know people like that, and we need to be careful that we are not like that. Uh, you need not only to know the facts, you need to believe the facts. But I've also told you already, even that is not enough. Now, you need to believe the facts in order to be saved, but believing the facts is not enough. Remember, there are so many in the visible church today. The college I went to uh, hasn't changed since the time that I went to it. They're still teaching the same thing. I had a chance to interact with one of the professors uh, less than a year ago, and he hadn't really budged from where he was when I was there 23 or 4 years ago. The idea that you just need to believe the truth. John writes, after all, in 1 John chapter 5, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. If you believe the facts, you're saved. 
But then the question is, well, what did John write in order that they might know this? He didn't just write to them to tell them that they're saved. He wrote to show them what the life would, your life would be like if you were in fact saved. So again, it's more than believing the facts. It's more than just repenting of wrong ideas. It's more than just changing your mind from what you originally thought was true to what is really true. James says, it's good that you believe the truth. That's good. But it doesn't go far enough. Again, he writes in James 2, verses 19 through 20, if you believe, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? You need something more. And that brings us to the final point. You need to have more than just the truth. And you need to have more than just the belief that, that those facts that, that, that you know about are in fact true. You also need to act on that truth. Now again, there are many who know what the Bible says. There are many who even believe that it's true. But there are many who have never really embraced what the Bible says. They've never really acted upon it in a consistent way, in a lifelong way. But James says, you must do this, or you have nothing more than what the demons have. You have a faith that cannot save you. James says, if you have a saving faith, you will have a working faith. You will have a faith that acts upon what it is you actually believe. Now, saving faith will produce a couple of different things, a couple of main things. It will produce faith. If you have a saving faith, as we saw this morning, you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him, or whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Believing that Jesus is the only one who can save you from judgment, you will trust him to save you. You will rely on what he has done alone, on his obedience, on his death on the cross, to make you acceptable to God. This, we might say, is, is, although we can't really say it's the first act, we'll just call it that. The first act of a truly saving faith, resting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, trusting Him to get you into heaven, trusting in what He has done. But the second thing that you will do is what James emphasizes here, which is really nothing other than repentance. You'll repent. You'll stop doing the sinful things. You'll begin doing the right things. That's what repentance is. Now again, as I've said, there's really no first and second here because these two things come together or they don't come at all. Again, uh, I would draw your attention to the example I gave of the, of the college that I went to and uh, uh, perhaps a majority of evangelical churches. Right belief equals salvation. That's not enough. You need more. You need to act on that belief. You need to trust Jesus. Some would say, yes, you do need to trust Jesus. But they would say you don't have to repent. Well, James tells us you do need to repent. When I was in college, we went to a meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society. And Earl Rodmacher was uh, debating John MacArthur on whether or not a person actually had to obey Jesus Christ. Earl Rodmacher said, no, you don't have to. James says here, faith without works is dead, but that dead faith can save you. That's all you need is a dead faith. And you'll be saved. And MacArthur, of course, rightly said no. If you have saving faith, it's a living faith, a faith that produces works. Saving faith always has repentance that is joined with it. Uh, to trust in Jesus Christ, you have to turn from your sins. Conversion is a two-sided coin, so to speak. You can't savingly believe in Jesus Christ and continue to live in the way that you lived before, in the way that you want to live, rather than in the way he wants you to live. Again, as John MacArthur aptly put it, you cannot receive Jesus as your Savior without submitting to him as Lord. He must be Lord to be Savior. 
which again for reformed believers is really a, taken for granted, isn't it? We know that's true. We've heard it so many times. We know that's what the Bible teaches, but not everybody knows that. Not everybody understands it, and some will fight against it to the grave and believe that we're adding works to salvation. This is not adding works to salvation. This is simply saying that if you believe savingly in Jesus Christ, it's going to transform your life. There will be works that follow. John the Baptist is going to tell us the same thing later in John chapter 3 in verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. It's interesting that John the Baptist doesn't tell us that, you know, that if you believe you're going to be saved, if you don't believe you're going to be lost. He says if you if you believe you'll be saved, but if you don't obey, you're not going to see life. Why does he, why the, the change in words here? Well, there really isn't a change in words. It's just that saving faith includes obedience. There will be a change of life. The kind of faith that saves us is a repenting faith. It's an obedient faith. It is a consecrated faith. It is a working faith. That's what James tells us. He says that merely claiming to be a Christian while remaining the way you were before you came to Christ is like pretending that you're really concerned about your brother or sister who is in need of food and clothing but doing nothing about it. You see, if your concern for your brother or sister was genuine, it would move you to do something for them. But if it doesn't, you're not really concerned. And in the same way, if your faith does not move you to do what Jesus tells you to do, then it isn't genuine either. James says in James 2, verses 14 through 17, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Earl Rodmacher, I don't know if he's changed his mind on this or if he's still living, but he would say, yes, that faith can save you. Well, you know what? That is a heresy that we would call heresy that can destroy you if you believe that. Because if you aren't living a changed kind of life, you're not saved, but yet... According to Rodmacher, you're convinced, or you'll, you, he'll convince you that you are saved, and so you'll go merrily on your way, not even knowing that you're not converted, but believing you're on your way to heaven. No, there must be works. What you do outwardly shows what you are inwardly. If Jesus is in your heart by his Spirit, it will be transforming your life so that you'll be, become, you'll be becoming, as it were, like him outwardly. Your faith will be seen in the way that you live, not just heard in what you say. Again, James writes in verse 18, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. As I mentioned earlier, probably this is the third time now, if you have nothing more than just the mere belief that what God says is true, you're no better off than the demons. They're not saved. And if they're not saved, what would make you think that you're saved if you have nothing more than they have? Again, verses 19 through 20, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, points to Abraham as the premier example of the fact that we are justified by faith alone apart from works. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul writes to the Romans, What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Abraham believed God. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. It wasn't by his works. It was simply by faith. He trusted God. And yet James reminds us that Abraham was justified by a faith that was not alone. Abraham acted on what he believed in James 2, verses 21 through 23. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Now, Again, are, are Paul and James at odds with one another as uh, Luther seems to have believed at least in some point in his life? No, because Paul is referring us to what it was that actually justified Abraham in the sight of God. It was the fact that he trusted God. James is pointing to the fact that we know that Abraham had a true and saving faith by the fact that it was more than just a, a bare belief in, in God's faithfulness but it was a faith that actually caused him to act. I mean, he was willing even to sacrifice his son, knowing that God would raise him again from the dead because God had made a promise to him that through Isaac, his seed would be called. Isaac hadn't had any children yet. God would have to raise him if Abraham put him to death. Abraham believed God. The scripture was fulfilled that he really did believe him. He really did trust him. He acted on that faith. If you have saving faith, you're, you're not only going to believe what God says, you're going to act on it. Your life is going to be transformed by it. You're going to do more than just simply lay claim to the fact that you have faith. You will actually do what it is you say that you believe. As we read in verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And James doesn't mean they're justified in the same sense that Paul is referring it to. You're not made right with God by your works. But when you lay claim to faith, that claim is justified by the fact that you have, a, well, you have actually, you're doing something that is agreeable to what you say you believe. You're actually doing what God calls you to do. You're trusting in Jesus and you're turning from your sins. You really do believe. Now, Rahab was a harlot who lived in Jericho. And when she heard what God had done for his people, how he had dried up the Jordan River, allowing them to cross, how he had defeated all their enemies all along the way, how he had intended or was intending to give uh, to his people the land in which Rahab was living, she believed God. She repented of her harlotry. And when the spies came in spying out the land, she received them into her home and hid them from the soldiers on her roof, sent the soldiers off on a wild goose chase, and sent the spies back to their camp in peace. She showed by what she did that she really believed God. We read in James 2 verse 25, in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. The conclusion is that saving faith changes you. To have a faith without works, James says, is like having a body without a soul, without having that which animates it or makes it alive. It only looks like it's alive, but it's really dead. Verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now, the reason why saving faith produces works is because of the new birth. Again, tying this together with what Jesus said to Nicodemus. The Spirit who opens your eyes to the beauty of God's kingdom because of its holiness, who makes you want to enter it through faith in God's holy Son, Jesus Christ, also opens your eyes to the beauty of everything God says in His Word, particularly His holy law so that you will want to live that kind of life. You see, that's the new nature. 
that God creates in you. And if you have that new nature, you will live a new kind of life. You will live as Jesus lived. You won't remain the same person. You will be transformed. You will have a regard for God. You'll have a regard for His ways and His Word. You'll search the Word of God to see with, you know, whether or not how you're living is agreeable to the Word of God. It will make a difference. You will live according to His will. And where you see that you're not living according to His will, you'll repent and begin to do what it is the Lord calls you to do. And so this evening as we prepare to come to the table, I would encourage you, I would exhort you, admonish you to compare your life with what James says should be the case if you really know Jesus Christ. Does it show that you have a genuine faith? Uh, one that not only believes the truth but acts upon it in obedience to everything that the Lord calls you to do and not because you feel like somebody's putting the screws to you but because you really want to do it, because you really love it. Or does your life show that you have a dead faith? Only a bare profession. You say you believe, but you're really not living any differently than anybody else in the world because you really don't love what it is you say that you believe. Well, if you have nothing other than just a claim to faith, the Lord tells you this evening you need to repent. You need to turn to Jesus. You need to put your trust in Him. And realizing again what Jesus said to Nicodemus, that the Spirit of God works in such a way that he, he blows or He breathes life into whom He wills when and where He wills, if you find within yourself that you've heard this message many, many times and are still unwilling to respond, you do need to realize that unless the Lord has mercy upon you, you're going to perish in your sins. So you need to ask the Lord, you need to seek the Lord for His mercy to change your heart by His Holy Spirit because only He can do that. Only He can give you the want to do this. Without the faith that comes from the new birth, you will face judgment. But if the Lord gives it to you, you will live forever. Remember, God is merciful. We saw this morning He sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. The Lord will not turn you away if you come to Him. So seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. May the Lord uh, help us to apply that word uh, to ourselves individually uh, as we need to hear it. Let's uh, bow in a, uh, a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.